I have good news for you. The first question is the hardest one. Oh, good. The first question is the hardest one, and then it's all smooth sailing. It's downhill after that. Because the first question is asking you to describe what your most recent book, Immortality Incorporated, is about. And that's a big question, because it's a big idea that you have tackled in this book. Yeah, what's it about? Um, well, all right. Um, I was always fascinated with this question, I think, maybe from the time I was a child and reading myths and, um, and, and maybe a few comic books. Uh, and, and then my work as a documentary filmmaker and my work as a, as a science writer, I would run into all kinds of different people. And actually, uh, there's one book out there that I wrote with William Shatner. Uh, and that's when I, this idea kind of got stuck in the back of my head because I met a scientist while we were having lunch, uh, and he just told, he told me out of nowhere that he was planning to freeze himself when he died and, and then you know, resurrect himself later. Uh, and, and I thought, wow, I never, I never heard anything like that that's really different, and I asked him about it. And uh, he made it an, an actually a pretty good argument for it. And, and so when I started to look into this more deeply, uh, I, I, went, I went back to Alcor, which is the name of this place, it's the Alcor Life Extension Foundation. And I thought, if there's anybody in the world that really doesn't want to die, it would be these people, right? So I, thought, I felt that that might be a good place to open the book. But before I, I decided to go into that, what happened was around 2013, word came out that a Calico, a company called Calico was founded. And this company is funded largely by Google. And in addition, the person that they brought on who, who agreed to be the CEO and, uh, and to run that company is a man by the name of Art Levinson. And Art Levinson is, you may probably most people don't know, the chairman of Apple. But he's also a very well-known uh, and highly respected uh, molecular biologist. And he had been the CEO and, uh, and uh, chairman of Genentech, which is the first uh, biotechnology company. And so he had run that company for many, many years and uh, many patents of his own. And so he, he was highly respected. Also happened to be on the board of Google. So Google knew him. And uh, it's all in the book how this came together. And by the way, the only people that know this story or the, were the only people that got this story was me. Because for some reason, Art Levinson only will talk to me. Uh, and so. Fair warning. I have more questions about that later. Uh, yeah. The, uh, not to, not to step on you, but Arthur Levinson speaks to nobody, and yet he was interviewed extensively for this book. So this is insight into a man who says nothing to anyone except for the person we're in the room with tonight. Yeah, it was, it was fascinating. It was, it was an interesting story as to how that happened. But, but in any case, when, when that happened, you go, whoa, okay, Google's involved, Art Levinson's involved, this is serious science. And it turns out that eventually Google and, and another company called AbV had put a billion and a half dollars just to start, just to get things rolling. Uh, and this is much, much more than you see in you know, some other a foundation that might spend a million dollars on something. I mean, it all sounds like a lot of money, but this is basically an unlimited amount of money to solve this problem with a person who really knows how to do it. They now have 200 scientists that are working at Calico um, on, on this. Uh, Shortly after that happened, another company called Human Longevity Inc. was founded, and that was co-founded by yet another fascinating scientist named Craig Venter, who uh, was the key scientist in sequencing the first human genome. And he became world famous. He was on the cover of Time magazine in 2000, whenever they finally completed that. And that's abs that work is absolutely essential to the whole book. Uh, and then there are other interesting characters. I mean, I should say that what I tried to do with this book is write it more like a novel than your standard science you know, uh, survey book. So that uh, I spent a lot of time with all of these scientists trying to figure out, because one of the things that, that occurred to me was, wait a second, you're going to try to solve what is arguably the most complex problem the human race has ever faced. I mean, you can't think of anything that would change the human race more than this, than maybe aliens showing up or a comet hitting the planet. You know, this is going to capsize everything. And so I, what I wanted to go back to the original question, what I wanted to do was really understand, are we actually at a time, at a point in human history, 
when science could solve this problem, which the human race has been grappling with from the beginning of time. Uh, and if it is, then how is it going to happen? What kind of people are behind this? Where does the money come from? You know, and so that's what I, I, I just set out to write that story. And, uh, and luckily I was able to get to all these people and I spent, well, I spent three and a half years working on it and I, and I spent an enormous amount of time with these people trying to, to understand the science, understand the money, understand why we want this so much, why we're scared of it in some ways, and um, you know, what motivated them, what in their li lives caused them to want to solve this problem. And very briefly, one of the interesting things is they all lost people that were very important to them early in their lives. And to, to remove any euphemism here, when we talk about the problem, we're talking about the problem of death. We're not even talking, like, when I saw the title of the book, Immortality Incorporated, I thought it was hyperbole. I thought it was clever mm -hmm. hyperbole, like, oh, this is another foundation that's looking to extend our lifespan another couple of years. Yeah, right. Then you get into the book and you're like, oh, no, no, we're looking at the genetic code of humans to see if death has to occur at all. Right, right. And then you're like, oh, excellent. I haven't been sold snake oil in a while. Yeah. <laughs> then you start getting into various people who have won almost every imaginable scientific award. I, I believe we have everything from Nobel Prize winners to... Well, all, all three of the ones that I mentioned, um, Venter, Kurzweil, and uh, Levinson have all won either the National Medal of... Uh, Science of the National Medal of Innovation and Technology, which is the highest award the United States uh, gives anyone. So, yeah, they're not fly-by-night operators. Now, this is an old problem. This is an old problem. This goes, I think the problem goes back to at least Gilgamesh. Right, right. I mean, I think the original cure for death was like mercury. Mm -hmm, yeah. So how, it's when you're researching Not a good one, yeah. <laughs> turned out to be a... Lethal. Problematic <laughs> solution. <laughs> How, how do you discern the science from the snake oil? Well, I mean, one of the first things was look who you're dealing with. You know, um, you, you, you were dealing with very serious scientists. And whenever I first sat down to talk with Arthur Levinson, he said, look, most of the, most of the science out there has been pretty, pretty bad. He said, there's some good, good science and longevity, but most of it's been pretty bad. And he said, so we are here to go. We're cleaning the slate. I'm getting the best scientists in the world that I can. Uh, he personally hires all of them. And he said, and we're going to start here. And, and when you look at Craig Venter's uh, track record, you know, he's also the, 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 the first scientist to create the first synthetic life form. Um, you know, and, and Ray Kurzweil you know, is, is a person who really made the first credible arguments that we don't have to age and die. Um, I think everybody who calls himself a futurist got that from Kurzweil. Yeah, I right, mean, right, right. Yeah, he changed the way we talk about the future. Yeah, yeah, and it turns out he, I mean, he was also very influential in, that's another interesting thing that, that comes up in the book, he, he was very influential in Silicon Valley. So he, you know, people are having, reading his books, they're going to his talks, Larry Page who runs Google, Bill Maris who is the head of Google Ventures, they know him, they've listened to him, they go, yeah, he's really on to something. And so whenever the time came, Bill Maris is a guy that actually came up with the idea for Calico, um, whenever it came up and he went to Larry Page and said, why don't we create a company that tries to solve aging? Why, why not? I mean, aging is the major reason we die. So if we're trying to solve every other disease. Why don't we try to solve this one? And by the way, what happens when you, if, if you solve aging, you solve pretty much every other major disease. You don't, most people get cancer after age 50. Most people get heart disease after age 50. Most people get all the major diseases that, that kill people and you get them because you're aging. And so if you stop aging or can even reverse aging, then those diseases go away. There are very few people at age 30 that have heart disease, you know, or cancer or any of the other diseases that get us. So, um, that's, that's the un underpinning here. We're talking about getting to the bottom of why we age. What are the, what's, what's the molecular, cellular reasons why, and can we change that and just stop it? And the most remarkable thing about the book, in my opinion, is how we do actually have some specific ideas on how to accomplish this. Mm -hmm. This isn't just, 
oh, you know what would be nice? Not dying. Yeah, right. I'm going to try that, and I'm going to spend a lot of money on it. No, there's like actual scientific ideas. And one of the most fascinating ones, uh, in my opinion, was pertaining to the naked mole rats, mm -hmm. which is not a sentence I get to say a lot. <laughs> yeah. So it, if you would take a second to explain to me how naked mole rats may be one of the keys to yeah. a, a longer life. Yeah. Well, first of all, you have to understand naked mole rat is, is indisputably the ugliest animal you've ever seen. <laughs> I mean, they're really, they're really an odd-looking little animal, but they are rodent, and uh, they uh, live, it was discovered, up to like 35 years, on average, about 35 years. And for, like, for, for a test scale, I think your normal mouse lives about three years. Right, right. right. So, so this, is, this would be basically like if a human happened to live like eight, eight or years. Yeah, yeah, right, right. So the, and the other important thing is they don't age. They simply don't age. They die from other things, but they do not age. Whenever they die at age 35, uh, if, if they happen to die at that age, uh, they, they're sexually active, they're uh, perfectly healthy, just as healthy, healthy as when they were three. Uh, and so this was really important to Calico. It was Calico that discovered this. Um, it was really important to Calico because Art Levinson, when I first met him, he said, when the very first meeting I had with him, he said, I'm not sure we can solve this problem. He goes, he, he said to Larry Page, he said, we might put a, a billion dollars down a rat hole here and nothing will ever happen. Uh, you know, so when he, when he discovered, when, when they discovered this and it came back to him, he, he then came to me and he said, I do now think we can solve it. He said, I don't know how long it's going to take. Um, I have some theories about it based on other things that, that I've learned, but um, he's very, very cautious. Uh, but in, so anyhow, these, these animals, and, and one of the reasons why this came up was because one of the things the Calico started looking at was they started looking around at animals that live unusually long. Naked mole rat's one of them, and it's a mammal, so it's important. But orange roughy, I don't know, if, has anyone ever had orange roughy? Do you remember? Yeah, well, so orange roughy, very similar to another fish, perch. You know, perch live three years. Orange roughy live 300 years. Same, almost the same exact genome. You know, so now what they're trying to figure out, and same thing with the naked mole rat, you go, look, at, look at these these rodents, and then you look at the naked mole rat, they have almost identical DNA, but obviously something's different. Uh, and so now what they're trying to do is figure out what are the differences. Once you figure out what the differences are, then you say, what are the analogs in humans? Because we have very similar DNA to any rodent, truthfully, 99% almost. Uh, and, and then you try to see, okay, where are the analogs? And then can we flip a s few switches and pretty much live like naked mole rats? Not look like na naked mole rats, but to, to actually, uh, you know, basically stop aging. One of the corollaries of that is about the meanest gift you can ever give somebody as a pet is a naked mole yeah, rat right. because it will be there forever. <laughs> For, yeah, right, right, because, they, yeah, actually... <laughs> I said, I, I said to uh, Levinson, I said, well, what does kill them eventually? And he goes, well, usually it's one of the other animals. I was actually thinking to myself, I, I was at the Cleveland Zoo not too long after I read your book, and I was looking at the naked mole rats, and I was like, you guys are going to kill each other, because if you're yeah. not, you're going to be mortal. <laughs> yeah. No one can stay that. <laughs> right, yeah, exactly. Yeah, well, I mean, I sometimes joke, if you're married for 900 years, maybe one day you just go, I can't take it anymore. Yeah. Yeah. So... It's either me or you. <laughs> now, speaking, speaking of animals from which we are learning the secrets of immortality, can you ex please explain to me what DAF2 is and, and how it helps worms live longer? Well, Cynthia Kenyon, she's actually been on some of the radio shows that I've been on. Um, Cynthia Kenyon is an extremely important scientist. She was, she was brought into Calico. And the reason why is because whenever, when everybody else in the early 1990s was saying, this is, you know, you do not want to be spending your career learning about aging because we don't have any control over it. Everybody just gets old. That's the way it is. And uh, she was determined to try to figure this out because she had looked around at other animals that she felt lived on really, she's the one that kind of brought this idea into Calico. You know, they're living really long. Why is it that they're living really long? 
And uh, so in some of the work, what, they do, the, do work in labs like this with these worms that are called C. elegans. Um, and, and the reason they do is because they basically die inside of 20 days. You know, so you can do a lot of tests and, and, and see what's going on from the, their, with their genetics. And they changed one gene called the DAF2 gene. And she was stunned to find that when they should have all been dying, they were just whooping it up. You know, they were fine. They doubled the lifespan of these uh, animals with just changing that one gene. And then subsequently learned that if they tweak the genes a little bit more, up the, they, they increase the lifespans on those worms up to 10 times. So that's the equivalent of, you know, again, that's the equivalent of living hundreds and hundreds of years. And, and that's really what we're talking about here. I mean, it's not quite fair to say we're going to be immortal because something will eventually get you, you know, a bus or a lightning strike or aliens will pick you up or something. Um, but, you know, you, we're, we're really basically talking about stopping the process that normally kills everybody. Yeah, a, a statistic from your book that stopped me was, I, I believe, and please correct me when I botch this, if we, as a species, cured cancer, yeah. it would increase the lifespan of the species on average about two and a half years. Two, yeah, 2.8 years. As opposed to if we somehow figure out what we did with those elegant worms and then applied it to ourselves, suddenly we are doubling our lifespan. Right, right, yeah. I mean, th that, th that uh, was um, something that came up in a conversation that Art Levinson had at a dinner table one night, and he had read somewhere that, you know, someone had discovered that if you increase lifespan. So he asked everyone at the table, he said, well, if we, let's say we cured cancer. You know, how much would we increase lifespan? And most everyone said, well, 10 years, 15 years maybe. And there was a, a, a Nobel laureate that was there, and he said, hmm, because I don't think too much. And uh, he said 2.8 years. And so, so, again, the real killer is aging itself. So, uh, yeah, there's all sorts of fasc fascinating uh, pieces of information that, that, that come up. And, and you know, I, I have to say, because I'm a writer first, uh, a science writer second, um, and one of the reasons I wrote the book as a novel was because I think one of the reasons the book works the science part of the book works is because I spent a lot of time explaining the, who these people were, what kind of children they were, what kind of scientists they became, what motivated them, you know, and so there's, I, I think that, that by the time you get to the science, you actually care about, you know, the, the, the science. And then, of course, it's, there's the big question, you know, do we really want to die? Uh, it's not... On that, that day, that moment, you know, it's not a fun thing. Now, you spent three and a half years researching this book. Mm -hmm. I'm guessing you have several thousand pages of research that didn't make it into the book. Right. Uh, are there any interesting scientist developments that you wanted to include but just ran out of pages? <laughs> well, there was, yeah, there was, yeah, I mean, my editors are like, I'm sorry, we've got to cut this book. I mean, you barely got Aubrey uh, de Grey in there, and Aubrey de Grey is a fascinating guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I could have written more about Aubrey de Grey. Um, you know, he, he is a fascinating character, and he truly was, I think, the first gerontologist, first scientist to say um, aging is a disease and it can be cured. And I'm going to show you how it can be cured, and that's in the book. And he's got like seven things that he says, this is what gets us, and, and, this is, and if we fix them, you know, we don't have to die. His, his work is different from Calico's in the sense that he sort of looks, looks at it this way. Um, when you're in Havana and you see all those cars, you know, that are still running, they're running because they just keep replacing the parts, you know, they keep fixing them, you know. And so he says that's what we can do with the human body. When something breaks down, we're going to fix it. When that breaks down, we'll fix that and we just keep on going just like those cars in Havana. Or for that matter, you know, a Boeing, you know, 737, well, maybe not a Boeing 737. Not the best yeah. <laughs> But you know, you can if you give, if you just can continually repair them. And but Aubrey himself is a fascinating 
you know, out of the, you know, I mean, just a fascinating character when you read about him. He's got, he's got a bit of a wit to him, so you never really know when he's messing with you. Uh, yeah, and yeah. Actually, I, I have to ask, you're dealing with a lot of geniuses and it's easy to throw around the word genius your eight-year-old who beats you at chess is a genius you know the, the guy who memorizes the declaration of independence Jesus. but you're dealing with actual geniuses how do you know when they're messing with you <laughs> well i like to think that i know enough you know to keep myself out of trouble um and and uh, i've been around you know the business of, you know the, the science for a long time and i think you kind of can snoop it out also these these people they have no reason to, to be lying or pushing it. You know, um, they have too much on the line because it's, it, it's out there, you know, and, uh, and, and you can get caught, you know, so that's not good. Uh, but their science is very, very solid. I mean, the logic of it is solid, the, the thinking behind it, and I spent a lot of time actually, I mean, you're, you're, you're like six or seven layers deeper than, than where you actually write it, you know, otherwise you can't write it well. I, I, there are two very difficult things you had to do. One, you had to understand some pretty nouveau science, and then you had to explain it to people who didn't have doctorates. Yeah, right, right. And you don't want to explain it in any other way. I mean, you know, it's, it's a little bit like, uh, like my dad used to say, you know, Will, Willie Mays, Roberto Clemente, they make it look easy. You know, why do they make it? They're, they're, they do great things, but they make it look easy. So, you know, the harder the writing, the, the easier the reading. Uh, and you, so you didn't, you didn't coin that. Yeah. <laughs> well, what is it like? A, a good writing is, or good reading is damn hard writing. Uh, yeah, yeah. I think I, I forget who who said that, but it's true. I mean, so you have to put a lot of that's that's for the three and a half years of you know banging your head against the keyboard, you know, to get it right comes from. And so yeah, but but it's when you get it done, and and if you actually can get it done right. Hopefully, it'll make it enjoyable for you. Now, I just had somebody tell me, tell me this afternoon, they said they picked the book up at 7 o'clock in the evening, put it down at 2 o'clock that night, they couldn't put it down. So that's a good sign. Now, now, this book is written on the cusp of science. That's a terrifying place to be because you are always one article away from being behind the cusp of science. Yes. How terrified were you that like, just as you'd given this book to your publisher as a, as a final draft, there was going to be an article written or oh. a press release sent out. Oh, that was horrible. Um, th yeah, um, my lovely wife, who is back back here, she she used to say, you know, this this book about living forever is going to kill you. Uh, <laughs> and uh, I think it was rougher on her than me. But um, but yeah, I constantly worried about that because it's changing so fast and it's changing all the time, and the and the and the advances are accelerating. Uh, and so I was constantly, you know, right before the book would get done, I was looking at the internet, I was checking with all of the people that I was writing about, you know, saying, is there anything new, something you're going to tell, something you can tell me? And uh, I guess the, the, best, the best thing about, and there, and there have been some advances. For example, there was just recently a very small study uh, of only 15 men, uh, but it shows that by... Um, uh, a certain supplement and, and a certain drug that after taking this for a year, these, they turned a genetic clock back two and a half years on these people. So they were actually genetically two and a half years younger than they were when they started. Uh, and they, that, they didn't really have to do anything else. They changed nothing else about their life. Another scientist at UCLA has recently uh, found what she thinks might be a genetic switch that can be flipped that eliminates inflammation. Uh, so if this is true, then those things aren't in the book, damn it. Uh, but on the, other, on the other hand, when you're dealing with the people that I, one of the reasons I chose the people that I did, and one of the reasons I chose not to write something thin about a whole lot of people, but to really dive deep into, into these scientists was because I think they're the top cream of the crop. You know, they have the money, they have the uh, expertise, and they have the track record of success. And so I wanted to stick with them, and I think so far, there really aren't very many people that are ahead of them. Uh, I had a question I had jotted down that I almost didn't ask, because it's the demographic question. And the demographic question is always touchy, but let's segue into it here. <laughs> Most of the key figures in your book 
are white male baby boomers. Yes. Do you think this is a topic that's particularly of interest to that demographic, or that's just the demographic that has access to the resources um, to put them at the vanguard? Well, yeah, I thought a lot about that. Um, unfortunately, one of the things that, 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 that's happened in science is that only fairly recently do women get into the scientific field more. So that's one reason why we don't have more women, and that's also one reason why some of the, and, and so these people are older because they've needed the time, you know, to develop the, the insights that they have and to, you know, the track record that they have. Um, so unfortunately, right now, you know, it's not like there's, you know, a great Latino or a great black woman who's at the top of the field. Um, I also think that Regard, although all of these people said, no, I'm not doing this to personally save my own skin, um, you know, you think more about your mortality the older you get. And you start to look around. And then also, I think they, they all said, look, if you really want to have a huge effect on health, then this is the problem you want to solve. You don't want to, I mean, why play whack-a-mole, you know, where you're trying to go, this cancer, this cancer, this cancer, this, this diabetes, you know, this particular disease, you think a million d different diseases that you're trying to solve, when if you can get to the bottom of what causes all of them, or most of them, then get to that, you know, and, and uh, so they were thinking big and they went after those issues. I'm not sure that answers your question exactly. No, 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 no. no. It, 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 does, it does the best you can. You know, it, yeah. I was like, hey, thank you for writing the book. Well, I read it. Solve racism for me. Yeah, uh, right, yeah. right. Now, um, talking about, once again, some of the key figures in the book, Ray Kurzweil, uh, Craig Ventner, brilliant men, but also not, not afraid of publicity. No. You know, they, they are not gentlemen who will turn down an opportunity to promote their work, in part because that's a way they get to continue their work. Right. Meanwhile, getting a hold of Arthur Levinson, <laughs> I mean, that, that's a difficult get. I have to ask, as, as a former journalist, how do you get Arthur Levinson to take these questions? Because he doesn't have to. He's no. got $1.5 billion behind him, whether or not he takes your call or not. Yeah, yeah. I, um... Well, I knew that I wanted to get to him. I knew that I wanted to get to Craig Venter. Um, and, and I was actually told Craig Venter was going to be the tough one. It turned out not to be. But, but I, had, I knew Ray Kurzweil because I had written stories about him in my own work. You He's know, loved Maggie. your book before. Yeah, and he, and he, uh, and he liked, he loved uh, my book, Thumbs, Toes, and Tears, and he wrote the foreword for it. So I would, you know, I would see him and, you know, it wasn't like we were fast buddies or anything, but I, I, you know, I could get a hold of him. And I knew that he was working at Google. You know, he's still working at Google as, you know, one of their top engineers now. And uh, so I said, do you know these guys? And he said, yeah, I, I, I know them. And I said, would you mind opening a door? I said, I just want to, you know, be able to get to them. And he said, sure. So he got, he got, he sent an email out to them. And uh, and they got back, and I was guess blind copied on them or something. But Venter immediately said, "Yes, I'm in." Um, and I think partly because the company had started, and you know, he, he just thought it would be a good way to pr promote it. Um, but Levinson's like, mm, he goes, "Nah, I, I think I better talk to Chip." And Ray gets back to me, and he says, "No, nah, no." Nah. He goes, "Don't worry, I'll I'll talk to him. You, you know, we'll take care of it." And uh, so Kurzweil goes back to him and says, you know, it, it's okay, you can trust Chip. And, uh, and he says, no, nah, I think I got to talk to Chip. <laughs> so that's the kind of guy he is. He's very cautious. And so he, he said, he sends, then sends me an email. And he says, hi, Art Levinson here. Uh, you know, do you have, can, can you spare five minutes for a conversation? And I'm like, I guess I could spare five minutes for the chairman of Apple. Uh, so I go, yes. And then I'm sitting there sweating bullets, you know, because he's going to give me a call, and I'm waiting. What is this guy? I, I know nothing about him, you know. I, I, I figure he's a real hardball kind of guy, you know. Um, and you know, I'm thinking, well, what's what's he going to? What kind of questions is he going to ask? And so we get into it, and he he said, right, look, he said right out of the gate, he said, I'm not going to give you the big headlines. I'm not going to say we're going to solve aging in five years. I'm not going to, you know try to attract attention to, to what we're doing. 
He said, so if that's what you're looking for, you got the wrong guy. And I said, that's not what I'm looking for. I'm just looking for the facts. I want to know what your science is. I want to know why are you doing what you're doing. And he said, you know, so we talked for about a half an hour. And at the end of it, I said to him, well, are you in? You know, you, you, you up for it? And he said, hmm, I don't think so. I'm not sure. He said, I said, why don't I come out and we'll meet face to face? And uh, he said, okay, why don't you do, come on out? And by the time I got there, he had pretty much, in his own mind, decided that he was going to talk. And one of the first things he said was, if, he said, if, are you going to tell other people that are involved in the book about the work we're doing at Calico while you're working on the book? Or would you wait until to tell those people those things when the book comes out? And I said, well, why? And he said, well, I'll tell you more if you wait until the book comes out. And I said, well, I want people to get as much information as possible, so I'll wait. And then I asked him, I said, will you wait to talk to other journalists? And he said, I can't promise that, but I'll keep it in mind. And he never has, he still hasn't talked to anybody. Um, in fact, I just met with him a couple of weeks ago, and he's told me some things they're doing. And you know, he said, but it's off the record. He said, you can't tell anyone. So, <laughs> so I can't tell you. There's nothing we can do for the I can tell you, but it's I can snowing. tell you this. They came out of the show. I can they tell you this. They have to die or not. I can tell you this. <laughs> <laughs> They're making progress. You've already made them feel bad because they ate orange ruffy that was going to live to be 400. <laughs> yeah, it ruined, it ruined him, too. You should have the pork chops, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Okay. Now, in my mind, Immortality Incorporated is the third book in a trilogy for you. Yeah, you wrote. It's a great way to put it. Yeah, I mean, we have toes, tears, and thumbs. Thumbs, toes, and I, tears. I did it in the wrong part. <laughs> That's okay. There are three T's, but the alliteration is ruined. <laughs> because it's thumbs, you have thumb, toes, and tears, which talks about ways humans are different from other animals. Right. Then you have Last Ape Standing, which talks about how we've evolved. Uh, right. Why are be, we the way we unique, are? Yeah to, yeah, to to be a unique species uh, among totally different from any other animal absolutely. on the planet. And now you have Immortality Incorporated, which talks about how we could become even different from what we've been now. Yes. Yes. I mean, all three of these books, in a way, are anthropology. Yes. Yes. Right. So They're my, all about the human animal. Yeah. So my question to you is: once you've once you've written about humans as potentially immortal, what is, what is there left to say in anthropology after that? Especially considering that uh, Harari already got to Homo Deus as a book title. Yeah, yeah, right, right. Um, well, I, I've, I've, been thinking about, I've been thinking about that, and I haven't actually blocked out a book on it yet, but I, I think that what, what is the next evolutionary leap that, that we see? You know, and um, I do believe, as Kurzweil believes, that there will be a melding of technology and biology. There is already a melding taking place. I mean, you all have your cell phones with you, I'm pretty sure. Mm -hmm. You know, um, it's you really... basic level, that's what a prosthetic is. Yes, right, right. Um, and, and we're embedded, and, and we've been embedding ourselves in technology since the first flint knife two million years ago. Uh, so how we handle that, uh, how it changes us, um, it will ra it's, it's going to radically change us. And, and really, this, this book about uh, longevity is just one piece of several huge pieces that are converging, that are going to change the human story uh, in ways that we can't uh, really, I mean, we can imagine it, but we probably will be wrong in what we're imagining. But it's, it's happening fast, and it's happening now. And, uh, and I believe that with this, uh, you will see some serious advances in the next four years. Uh, and, and because of that, I want you to, you know, take good care of yourselves and you hang in there and uh, you might live much longer than you think. Now, you know how I told you the first question was going to be the roughest? I lied to you. <laughs> <laughs> But I did it because I care. <laughs> now, when you say 
human immortality. Part of us says, that sounds neat. But also, if we're going to be honest, part of us kind of rebels against the notion. Mm -hmm. yep. Now I'm going to ask specifically about th that instinctive rebelliousness from that. And because I'm a pretentious person who works at a library, <laughs> I'm going to use it with Kurt Vonnegut. Okay. Okay, Kurt Vonnegut has a short story in Welcome to the Monkey House called Tomorrow and Tomorrow and Tomorrow. Mm -hmm. with, in, um, yeah, I know you. <laughs> well, there's um, another story I know too, uh, that's similar, but go ahead. Yeah, but they create this drug that ends aging, and it ends up with a grandpa in a really cramped apartment trying to find a way to get rid of his family. <laughs> right. I want to make sure I phrase this though. Are there any concerns among the people you interviewed about overpopulation, or, or perhaps the carbon footprint of a deathless humanity. Yeah, yeah, um, and, th and there's a, there is a section, probably the person that gets hit hardest on this is, that are in the book, are Ray Kurzweil and Aubrey de Grey, um, because they both were probably first out of the gate to say, we can live an extremely long time. Uh, and so th the kinds of questions that always come up are, well, there's gonna be way too many people, uh, so we're gonna burn the planet down. We're already burning the planet down. Uh, so, so that's one of them. Uh, is there going to be enough food? You know, who are the people that are going to, to get to live long and who are going to be fodder for the rest of us? You know, well, truthfully, a lot of these are scientific tropes, you know, and we all know, uh, particularly as a writer, you know, drama is interesting. So you can't really do a science, science fiction book that has everyone living happily forever after, you know? So all of them, almost all of them are dystopian. Uh, I don't think that it has to happen that way. I think that, um, first of all, one of the things that we're seeing is the fewer and fewer, since the, since the 1980s, the actual rate of, uh, incre rate of increase in the population has been dropping. Uh, more and more people, particularly millennials, are opting to live later, to not have children, or to have children much later, these all have a huge effect on how many people we actually have in the on the planet. As uh, emerging co countries become more like first world countries, they're reducing their populations. As women become better educated, they're having children later. Uh, so I think, you know, some there's a lot going on, and technology itself may solve some of the problems that we're creating. You know, we hope that. If we rapidly, you know, move to solar energy, then we're not going to be creating, you know, the kinds of problems that we currently have with, uh, you know, we'll, we'll certainly slow the damage that we're doing with climate change. But the point is that there is an enormous, uh, there's a lot going on. And I guess where I really came, came to on this was I don't think very many people, regardless of whether, let's, let's say that somebody says, you know what, this is a really bad idea. We should not all be living, you know, several hundred years. Uh, let's say that everyone agrees. So which people are going to say, okay, I'll die? You know, I mean, if someone walks up to you and you have cancer and, and they say to you, we have a drug that can keep you alive for another three years, six months. I mean, people will almost universally say, okay, I'll take it because we all, it's built into the DNA of, the, of, of every living thing to live as long as possible. And it's, it's a very hard thing to be facing the abyss, you know, and saying, this is the moment I'm going to die. Uh, and so I, I just don't think that, that if, if th this is going to happen, that's my belief, this is going to happen. And when it happens, I think that almost universally everyone's gonna say, I'm in. Uh, and, and so what we really need to be doing is not saying we should stop that because it's like saying stop cell phones or stop, you know, stop almost any kind of uh, advances that we've had. Instead, what we sh should be doing is saying this is going to happen. So as a society, we better start thinking about it. We better get on top of it before it gets on top of us. And I do think that's possible. But first, I had to write the book. Now, to make my second, and I promise, last pretentious literary question. We talked about Gilgamesh before. Yeah. And to give you your five-cent version of Gilgamesh, 
guy has a friend, friend dies, existential crisis, tries to figure out how to stop death, doesn't work, still dies anyhow. And, right. and they, it's but it's the search for, it's for the search for it's, eternal it's youth. It's better when you read it. <laughs> uh, but there's a lot in the Willoughby there, Library. But there's a there's a part in there where they talk about what the meaning of life is if it's not to live forever. So without reading the entire quote about being blissful in your loins because this is the work of mankind, how does the meaning of life change when your lifespan is tripled? Yeah, well, my wife and I have had a lot of uh, conversations about she that. And yeah, oh yeah, you, you definitely should, but I don't know how she'd feel about that. <laughs> um, she's fascinating. Uh, yes, th this comes up a lot. I mean, a lot of times people will say, well, what gives meaning to life is death. You know, that, that, that you really will focus on, on, on your life and, and you'll live a better life because you know that you're going to die at some point. And I don't know that that's entirely untrue. I don't know that it's entirely true. I think it probably depends on the person. I know a lot of people that are incredibly curious. They're lively. They get up every day and they are ready to, you know, rock and roll. You know, they're, they're happy to be alive and they don't want to die. You know, they have too many other things that they want to do. Uh, and then, you know, there are people that will say, no, you know, I, I want to die. It's the best thing for the human race and everything. And, and, and I, I have to say, okay. But when is it that you're ready to die? Is it Tuesday at three o'clock? You know, so I'll be there. And you know, let's see. Like the Logan's Run, watch yeah. on. Like no, nobody wants to say like, yeah, no, death is good for us. But let's not agree on a date. Yeah, <laughs> right. Yeah, at some point, yeah, I'll I'll do that. Um, and of course, you know, the younger people will go. Well, I, you know, that's. Mm -hmm. You know, but when you're younger, you don't think you're going to die anyhow. Uh, so I think it's a complex question. I think it's a complex uh, human question and psychological question. I, I, I think one of the things that occurred to me was, are you going to be bored after 300 years? I, I hope not. Uh, you know, or another question would be, how fast, you know how time seems to accelerate the older you get? Well, by the time you're 300 years old, I mean, years are just going to be going by like that. I mean, what, psychologically, I, I'm not, I'm, 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 that's what I'm more fascinated about. What, what is going to happen psychologically to us if we're living that long? And what is going to happen to our inner relationships uh, if we live that long? Someone like Ray Kurzweil, it's in the book, you know, would say, well, we're going to be uploaded to the cloud because we will, you know, because we'll be so immersed in, in our technology and so your brain will suddenly go from being this big to being that big, you know. And so there'll be an unlimited amounts of information that you can get your hands on and uh, and explore. And we'll you know? still mostly just use it to check sports scores. Though. Yeah. Well, certainly that. Yeah. I mean, yeah. The that's going to be a big part of the game. Um, but yeah. I mean, and I know that you know when when like I just mentioned this this bit about Ray. Um, Ray Kurzweil, but the interesting thing about Ray Kurzweil, and I write about it in the book, is he's one of these people that when you hear something like that, you go, that is so crazy. But when you listen to how he explains it and how he has thought it through, you get to the end of it and you go, son of a gun, I think he's got something here. You know, so this stuff, I mean, think of the things that 50 years ago sounded insane that we do routinely now. I mean, if you had said, you're all going to be carrying around these little instruments, you know, that give you unlimited amounts of information, just like that. And you can talk to anybody in the world anytime you want. Uh, you can, you know, you can find out how to get from point A to point B. You know, you would have said, that's, it's crazy. It's science fiction. You know, it's just not going to happen. Everybody's got them. One of the things that's impressive about Kurzweil is if you approach him as a philosopher, you're like, oh, okay, well, it's, it's a philosophy, it's opinion. But then he does the math for you. He's like, yeah. no, 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 I've, I've calculated this. Right. I'm not going to die. Right, uh, right, right, yeah. Now it's it, a fascinating thinker. I'm going to ask you a personal question, and be comfortable declining if you'd rather. Do you have children? Yes. How do they feel about you not dying? Oh, we joke about it. <laughs> 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 Honey? <laughs> um, that's, that's funny. It's funny that you brought that up because I used to joke with, we have a melded family. We have two children each. And we, when we married, we have four of them together now. And uh, 
Um, my daughters, I used to joke with them. You know, I, I, when they were wee little, I'd say, yeah, well, I'm an alien and I'm not, I'm not gonna die. Um, and you'll, you'll learn all about it. And, you know, and then I would make these stories up and everything, and they, they got a big kick out of it. Um, and so, <laughs> And so now they, you know, now they joke about it. You know, they, they, they kind of buy. They kind of go, well, I, I don't know. Maybe he'll pull it off. I, you know, who, who knows? I mean, did did write a whole book about it and spent a lot of time on it. So, um, but it's a great question. I, I think they'd be okay with it. But maybe when three hundred years rolls around, they wouldn't feel that way. I don't know. <laughs> I'm, I'm preemptively exhausted by the idea of my own great-grandkids. I already hate their music. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Well, there's an, there's an example of, you know, psychologically, how will we change? Because, you know, you're going to be locked into loving the Beatles, you know, and everything else after that sucks. Um, I, I don't know, I mean, you know, because we do tend to get more ossified, you know, the older we get, psychologically, not just physically. Um, so you it'll be that, interesting to see. But you interviewed a whole lot of people who are older than you, like Art Levinson and Kurzweil, who are not ossified. I mean, no. you're in a room full of people who want to spend their life learning. Yes. I, I think, you know, to let yourself be ossified is to predecease your death. Yes, yes. I don't think I that's necessarily agree. a guaranteed trait. Or something. No, no, no. It's not, it's not that it happens to everybody, but um, a lot of people feel, feel that way. And they go, oh, I'm getting old and, you know, so... You know, it's, it's just, it's going to happen. It's a done deal. And I guess, you know, part of this is, no, it doesn't have to be that way. And if you, if you don't feel that it's that way, then go for it. Now, I, I don't know exactly what time it is because clocks scare me. <laughs> You've answered all of my questions about the book itself, but I do have a couple more questions sure. in, in general. Uh, I mean, if you guys are willing. Yeah. Then. You, you wrote a book with William Shatner. Mm-hmm. Are there any other Star Trek captains that you would like to work with? <laughs> any other? <laughs> uh, and why Cisco? Great choice. Uh, well, I, working with Bill Shatner turned out to be a really great experience. Um, so I, I'm, I'm partial, you know, to him. Uh, you get to call him Bill. That's big. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I, when I met him, I actually, when my agent called me and told me that you know, that we might work on a book together, that he, he said, would you be interested in writing a book with William Shatner? My first reaction uh, was, well, I heard he's kind of a jerk. There it is. Yeah, there it is. <laughs> and it's, it's fun. It's fun. We had a lot of fun writing it. Um, and uh, we... So anyhow, when I, I, you know, I said, well, I hear he's kind of a jerk. You know, I go, no, 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 you, you'll, you'll like him. You know, he's going to give you a call. So he called me. I actually had the flu, so I was really trying not to be sick uh, in the conversation. And, and we had a great conversation. And I went, wow, this is a, he's a great guy. He's a nice guy. And, um, and we just kind of went on a road show. And we went all over, all over the place. I mean, I knew enough. I wasn't a big Trekkie, necessarily. I watched Star Trek. Um, but I, I knew enough about the science that was related to the stuff that was in Star Trek. So what we end up writing the book about is all the stuff that Star Trek imagined and how it was now coming true. You know, and, and this is, um, geez, Jesus, I can't believe it's 20 years ago. Um, but it's still, it's still really, yeah, it's still really good. Um, I mean, it still holds up really well because you have stories about time machines and, you know, androids and... Uh, you know, uh, getting from a warp drive and, and stuff like that. And so we went and we found these scientists that were working on all these things, and some of this stuff has happened. Cell phone, you know, flip, flip phone. Uh, looks just like the, 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 yeah, the communicator. And, and, yeah, more and more science are seeing things like tricorders and all that. So it was just fun. We, we just sort of went out on a road show, and we would go to see all these interesting scientists, and he and I would just ask lots of questions, and then I would go back and write. Because as he put it when we first met, um, I said, so how do you normally work with another writer on something like this? And he just kind of looked through his glasses like this, and he goes, well, I see you writing the book. He makes a compelling point. Yeah, but it was, it was great fun to, uh, to be with him. He's incredibly bright and, uh, and, and fun and funny and... Uh, so I just sort of created a, a character that's part me and part him and, and, uh, and wrote it, and we had, we had a good time. Who are some, there's a lot of good science writing happening right now. 
Yeah. I, I, we're going we're gonna to look back on this as a halcyon age of popular science books. Mm -hmm. Are there any other science writers who've written a book recently that you've really enjoyed? Oh, wow, recently. Um, I, I tend to... Uh, feel, feel free to make recently mean what you need to. Yeah, yeah well, I mean... I, two and a half years. I, I, th there's a great magazine called The Week, um, which, you know, I, I read every week. Um, and, and they ask me to, to, to uh, give them six books, science books, that they felt cha that, that really changed me. And, uh, and so I, I highly recommend, because these are, these are books, I think, that stand the test of time. Some of them go back quite, quite a few years. But anything by Lauren Isley, uh, anything by uh, Lewis Thomas, uh, I mean, his stuff is uh, remarkable. Th these are all books that are not only fascinating, but they're really well-written books. I mean, I'm a big, big believer that uh, science books need to be literary. They need to be well-written uh, to, you know, otherwise it's too abstract and it bores most people, you know. This is it's why I work so hard to write, the, you know, this particular book the way I did. Um, I'm trying to remember what some of the other, other ones are. Uh, Carl Sagan, Carl Sagan's books, uh, Dragons of Eden, you know, changed my life, uh, li literally. Um, so those are the kinds of uh, writers that come to mind. I'm so busy working on my books and the next book that, you know, I, I'm not, I wish I could just absorb books, you know, like that and, and, and somehow download them, but uh, Soon, Kurzweil is working. Yeah, on he's this. working on that. He's working. He's on this. working on it. And if anyone can solve it, it would be him. I mean, but, but very quickly, by the way, this guy, Ray Kurzweil, is not just a futurist, but he's an inventor, and he invented optical character recognition software, and he did this so, for people that are blind, so the people that are blind could hear a voice talk to them. Um, he also invented the Kurzweil piano, so it's the first electronic piano. Uh, not the first one, but he was the first person to create a piano that could also play stringed instruments and cymbals and, you know, every, every, virtually every instrument. And, they're, you know, the, the fidelity of them is amazing. At most music studios you go to, you will still see a Kurzweil piano. Right. I, I'm embarrassed to admit that I'd heard of the Kurzweil piano, I'd heard of Ray Kurzweil, and I'd never added Put two and two together. together. Never thought yeah. of it. Oh, oh! <laughs> yeah, right, right. And then, of course, he, he I mean, when you hear... Uh, when you talk to Siri or Alexa, the software, uh, the underlying uh, foundational software that enables you to do that so that it can hear your voice and then talk back to you is his technology. So uh, that's what I mean by these being cream of the crop people that are in the book. You know, I'm, I'm not just plucking people out that kind of go, well, they seem interesting last week, uh, so let's put them in the book. These are people that are first rate thinkers. Absolutely. Uh just two final questions. You, you've been to six continents now for work. Yes. What's the one that didn't make it, and what's it going to take to get you there? Ah, well, it's Antarctica, and, <laughs> and it's actually going to be taken care of in the next uh, book that I'm planning, which is called Aqua, the Story of Water. And we're going to go to all seven continents for that. And uh, Sin, Sin is going to go, too, she says. Uh, and uh, but that was that was, almost got there actually for uh, doing uh, uh, so, uh, some work on documentary, but uh, it just didn't work. The timing didn't work out, and so you know I didn't I didn't get to do that. But um, you know, and, and when you say you get to six continents, you know I, I I used to think, oh wow, I've really been around. Well, all you got to do is look at a few things on a, on a world map, and you realize how little you really have seen. You know, I mean been. To Asia, I've been to like a few places in Asia. Asia is immense, you know, same thing with Africa. But I have been lucky enough and I consider myself enormously lucky to have gone to the places that I've gone. And I would love to, you know, we're doing the world tour, we call it. And, uh, you know, we're going to spend a couple of years as part of this project uh, hitting all, all the continents. And, uh, and by the way, not doing it on, by jet. Wait, so you mean you're taking a plane or you mean you're taking a boat or you're getting really good at swimming? No, we're going to, we're going to be either boat or car or train or feet. It's very hard to or drive feet. to Antarctica. No, but you can get, you, you can get. Running lead from Argentina. You can, you can get down to Argentina and then you take a boat over, you know, mm -hmm. so. 
lots of, lots of boats, lots of boats and planes or trains. You know, it's going to take a while. But it's going to be lovely. It'll be interesting. It'll be interesting. I'm sure it'll be challenging sometimes. Now those are all of my questions. Is there anything more that you'd like to add? Is there any question that I should have asked you about the book that I neglected? No, I want to know what, if you guys have any questions. I, I always have a million questions, but I'd rather hear yours. The first one that I think of is growing older. I mean, as it is, I have problems remembering things now. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I think that the older we get, our memories. Is that one of the things that gets dealt with? Because if we're going to live older, you know, I can just imagine. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great, that's a great, really great question, um, and it came up in the first meeting I had with Levinson. And Levin, one of the things Levinson said was, he said, I'm worried about two things. He said, one is that we won't basically be able to solve the problem, you know, the underlying reasons why we age. Um, that it may be virtually an impossible problem to solve. The second one was, he said, so let's say we, we solve it, but we can't really save our brain. Uh, and he said, at 60, very few people have Alzheimer's. At 90, almost everybody has Alzheimer's. He said, so we don't want people that are being 120 years old and that have Alzheimer's disease. Turns out that one of the good things, I mean, another animal that's, that's mentioned in the book is the bowhead whale, which I went up to the Arctic to where the bowhead whales live. And they also, although the, the science isn't as solid on this because it's difficult to keep an eye on a bowhead whale, um, let alone thousands of them, but like naked mole rats, they don't seem to age. Uh, and so what they found with these animals is, guess what? Since they don't age, their brains are also very good. It's not like naked mole rats have, I mean, rat dementia, you know, uh, <laughs> you know when they're 35 and their bodies are fine. Uh, everything seems to be good. The same underlying uh, genetic switches that enable your body to work enable your brain to work. Your brain and body are both, I mean, what we call our body, your brain is your body too. So they seem to be connected. So in effect, you would be more youthful, including your brain. Yes? Could that incite some real yeah, yeah. Sure, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, it's going to be disruptive, uh, but I don't think, I don't believe that this is going to be a case of only the rich people getting, you know, access to this technology. I mean, I, with technologies, rich people usually get access first, and then the, everybody else gets it. Uh, one way to look at this is, in 1900, the uh, average lifespan in the United States was 47. It's now currently around 80, uh, you know, depending on whether you're a man or a woman. Uh, most of the people that have benefited from that are everyone. I mean, people that are really poor do die younger, but mostly the science and everything is available to pretty much everybody. I think that that will continue. Also. If you just look at it from a business point of view, pharmaceutical companies, which would be the people that are driving this, uh, they want to get those drugs into the hands of as many people as they possibly can. Uh, so I don't see any reason why they would withhold it. You know? uh, and insurance companies that are also dr would drive a lot of this, they want people to be as young as possible. I mean, the amount of money that we spend worldwide on the last few years of life is frightening. It's trillions of dollars. And so it would be so much better for everybody, personally as well as societies around the world, if people weren't sick as they are dying. You know, it'd be so much better if you were healthy. So um, I think that in the long run, and as a society, any society, we have to make sure that we make this available to everybody. But I think almost naturally it will become available to everybody. Um, but I do believe that, for example, I think the first wave is going to be stem cells. Uh, stem cell therapy is a big section in the book about stem cell therapy and the work that Robert Hariri is doing there. Um, and I think we're quite close. That's what I'm, when I say four to five years that we're going to start to see some advances, that's where we're going to see them. And those are, those are stem cells are cells that can be injected or, or somehow provided to your, your body that will regenerate 
parts of the body that are dying, you know, that are essentially falling apart. Uh, and, and so those probably, the, the, the richest people will probably get access to those first, but then I think quickly it'll become available to anyone that walks into their doctor. Already, I mean, whenever uh, Craig Venter's genome was sequenced, it cost $3 billion. I, I, you can now have it done for about $1,000. You can go to 23andMe and get, you know, a, a significant portion of it done for $150. And a lot of people, I've had people say they go into the doctor and the doctor says, I think we should sequence your de genome and it will cost you nothing. And I think that'll be, you know, within a couple of years, most people would just have their genome checked just like they go get blood tests. Because it's that easy to do now. And it can be done that quickly. So I certainly hope that everyone will have this available to them. That was actually like one of my concerns is like will Bill Gates be the only one that can afford this? But actually I was wondering like have you seen any like movies like in the last couple of years that you've really enjoyed that would kind of be based around the same science? You know, I'm trying to think. I mean, there's, you know, there's, there's like Logan's Run and, you know, those kinds of movies. But I can't think of anything recently that strikes me as a movie that's specifically about that. I'm finishing up a science fiction novel of my own, but it's not directly related to just this. You mentioned you were a Star Trek guy. I assume you're an Asimov guy. You seem like I liked, the kind of guy who burned through Foundation like 16 times. Yeah, I liked, I liked Asimov. I liked Heinlein. Some of Heinlein's work. I, I love, love, love Ray Bradbury, you know, because oh, yeah. he's a true literary. I mean, he was a poet as well as a great science fiction writer. Um, you know, so, you know, I, th those were, if, if I were to say what, you know, uh, affected my writing. I mean, Ray Bradbury's book, Chronicle, uh, Martian Chronicles, when I read it, in high school, I immediately sat down and wrote my first short story. You know, that's, that's the effect that it had on me. So I'm trying to think, I mean, I don't know, does anything come to your mind that's recent about that subject? There I mean, there's a lot of great science fiction. Like, I can't think of the actor, but it's a famous actor that... Uh, it was a Gemini Man or something like that? No, it was like a couple years ago, like the person was like uploading his brain into a computer. Yeah, yeah well, there's, yeah, there's quite a few of those. I mean, there's her, I think, it was, or she, and... and uh, Johnny Depp with the dream. And Johnny, Johnny Depp. Johnny Depp, and, Depp, I think, was uh, the Yeah, 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 yeah. That's very Kurzweilian, you know. Uh, and and uh, there was another, there was another uh, one that was very similar to that. Um, but... I think that's a little further afield. I think we're much closer on the biological side. I think that, I think we're going to see. Uh, I do. I do think that we are really melding with our technologies. Uh, exactly how that plays out, uh, I'm not sure. You, you know. But if you get a hold of Ray Kurzweil, he'll give you a date. You know. He'll tell you exactly when he thinks it's going to happen. I think he says. He's done the math on it too. So. Yeah. Yeah. I think he say, he says like 2028 was is when the first computer will be as intelligent as a human. Uh, as powerful as a human, it will be as intelligent as a human by 2045. Well, I'm not as smart as my phone, so I'm terrified. <laughs> yeah, yeah. If I could turn my alarm off, I'd be more eager for that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. No, I mean, are, any, any, uh, yeah, all, yeah. All these issues are, you know, both. I, again, I mean, one of the one of the the things that I always say is that with the first flint knife, which is two million years old, and the first technology, it's literally double-edged, you know, and and all technology is double-edged, mm -hmm. in that sense. I mean, whether it's nuclear power, or cell phones, or, you know, whether it's computer computer science gets used in a million different ways, and sometimes it's good, and sometimes it's not. I was going to ask about that, which is the uh the obvious occurrence of unintended consequences. Yes, yes. Would suicide clinics be freely available? I, I would think so. Okay. You know, I, I, I mean, we've, we've talked about this, the same kind of conversations we'll have around the dinner, you know, with right. friends and stuff. And, and I, I think so because, there, you know, and, and less, unless by some, you get hit by lightning, you know, you're not going to die. Uh, and so, yeah, you would have to make a choice at some point, say, I'm done, 
you know. Forever and, just not being happy. Yeah, right, right, right. 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 And, and, you know, who knows what the reasons will be because we are literally in completely uncharted territory here. Yeah. People do not live. But in a weird way, we are seeing play, things that were uncharted. I mean, just the fact that we're still alive, you know. I mean, the fact that you've been to six continents. I mean, most emperors didn't get past one. Right, right, right. Oh, yeah. Well, all of us, the, the, the lives, the kind of lives we lead are, are, are like the kinds of lives that emperors lived, you know, even 200 years ago. My um, greatest growth experiences were as a result of being on the point of death in many, many instances. Well, I think in general, don't you, that uh, when you have friction in your life, that's when you learn the most? And, and nothing could give you more friction than almost dying. Uh, yeah, I, can, I can agree with that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, uh, I've, I've gotten a noogie from an older brother. <laughs> <laughs> but but, the, but the, key thing, the key thing about that is you're still alive. And so you benefit from that experience. You know, so the, the horrible thing would have been if you had died. Well, you don't know. Well, no, I don't know. No, but Kurt's wild brother. <laughs> no, I, I don't know. None of us know. Do you believe in an afterlife? Uh, I personally, personally, I don't know. So I'm agnostic. I don't know. I, there, has, there's, there doesn't seem to be any proof one way or the other. I don't know that there has to be proof one way or the other. I, I would love it if, if there was an afterlife. Uh, well, but do, would I love it? Yeah, uh, well, if, 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 if it's in the sense that I could sit down and spend the evening with E.E. E. Cummings, you know, or uh, Isaac Asimov yeah, or something like that, line, uh, I like that. Heaven for the climate and hell for the company. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. This but this is a very secular philosophy going on. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, well, and that's true like in the other in the other books that I wrote, you know, I would just say at the outset if if you if you really don't believe in evolution, then you know, by all means close the book and don't, don't read it, you know. Uh, you know. No, no, no. It, I, and actually what you raise about it being a very secular philosophy. Yeah. Uh, the the book is it goes all around the world, but it is very much based in Silicon Valley, and that's a pretty secular scene. Mm. Well, yeah, the yeah. The is on the body mm -hmm. being of more of greater importance than the, the soul or the mm -hmm. spiritual, and passing over to the next. Well, I would dimension. I would agree I would agree with you about passing over, but I wouldn't agree with you about it not being about uh, you know your spirit or your your personality because that's that's part of you, you know, um, and you can't know that you have it for sure unless you're alive. Um, so when, when I look at it from my point of view, my personal point of view, I'm not saying, I'm not saying what other people think, uh, you know, it's just a matter of uh, I'm having a good time, you know, I'm loving life. So I'd like to keep that going uh, as long as possible, you know, and I think there are a lot of other people that would too. Should we take two more and then, then sign some books? Is that okay with you guys? Yeah. Okay. Uh, yes, sir. Yeah, I have, uh, I have a question, too, about the spirituality. But uh, in spirituality, there's very a material aspect, too, because the doctrine is the resurrection of the body. So what does that mean if you say that kind of doctrine in mm -hmm. your Sunday worship? It really mm -hmm. means that your body's going to resurrect, so you're going to have an immortal life through a theological approach to this. So that's true. It's secular in a way. Yep. It's that's not absent of the theology, philosophy. Yeah, it's not like, uh, yeah, that's uh, in the Bible, yeah, or the, the New Testament. Yeah. Well, it's a Catholic teaching. Yeah, it's a Catholic. It's Christian. Yeah, but it, Christian. but yes, that there will be a re resurrection of the body as well as the, as the, the soul. But as far as evolution of the human soul, a lot of some philosophers say that 500 BC is when man advanced, and no more evolution has occurred in human nature and human psyche. 
Yeah, well, that's a whole, that's a, that's yeah, a, so that's, that's a big question. There, there, there's a philosopher that made a quip that like the last 2,000 years have just been footnotes on Socrates. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's and, Jeez, yeah. I'm so, I'm so not ready for this conversation. <laughs> <laughs> but it, but it's a, yeah, it's a, it, it, it's a big, it's a big issue. And that's probably because our genetics have not really changed because it doesn't generally change that fast. Mm -hmm. it takes a hundred thousand years for a gene yeah. to change. Yeah. Economics of the whole thing. Uh, it will completely capsize economics. I mean, uh, there, there's a there's a number of different ways to look at it. Um, some people, and and really in in a way, some, some of this comes down to some people are pessimists and some people aren't. Um, you know, so some people will say to me, "Oh my God, I already hate my job. You know, now you're going to make me work for a hundred years." <laughs> yeah. Uh, and, and you know, my social security is going to run out, or you know, we're all going to go bankrupt, or you know. So there's that side of it, and then there's the side of it that says, well, you know, I'm I'm squirreling away my money, and now my money's making money, and you know, if I'm around for hundred, hundreds of years, I'm going to be wealthy, and I'm going to be doing whatever I want to do. And it's probably going to be some, some, somewhere in between. But I do believe that that we all go through a journey, uh, you know, when it comes to career. Not not all. Uh, many people go through a journey in their career where they're looking to do work that is meaningful to them. And they get better and better at it, usually. And, um, and so if you live longer and you make some decent, I mean, if you make continually bad choices, it's not going to be fun to be alive. But, uh, <laughs> you know. Except what it is. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. And then, so that raises that. But, you know, so I, it's just going to be very, it's going to be, like I said, we're in uncharted water here. You know, we, that's why I think as a society, we need to really go, you know what, this is, this is happening. So let's get on it before it gets on us. You know, we're going to be the bug on the windshield. Thank you so much for coming. Oh, it was a pleasure. Thank you.